Instagram and put some um, posts out and things like that. Okay. And, uh, I got a newsletter out today, this morning. So I talk about last minute, but yeah, that's, frustrating. I'm, I'm impressed you're getting it done because you were pretty sick. Yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, but it should have been happening the end of last week, but it didn't. So I saw a few, few people signed up today on the back of the newsletter. Um, well, they, we're a new registrant every like a couple of an hour right now too, so they keep rolling in. All right, you guys, I'm going to turn off my camera and hit the start button, and you guys have fun. Okay, we're here if you need us. Okay, okay. thanks, Andrew. Hi everyone. Welcome to Chicago Responsible Jewelry Conference's online gem fair. I'm Liz Kantner and I'm excited to introduce, although it feels like everybody already knows him, Stuart Poole, owner of 1948. Um, Stuart is a spe specialist in responsibly mined and fully traceable colored gemstones, mainly sourced directly from mines in Sri Lanka and Tanzania. He runs a gem. He runs gem trading companies, 1948, Ruby Fair, and Crown Gems, as well as being one of the co-founders of Fair Luxury, a group focused on positive change in the jewelry industry, and a key member of Moyo Gemstones Project, which you might have seen them speak earlier today. Hi, Stuart. Hi there. Hi, Liz. Um, so tell us about your companies and everything you do. Wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> that was a bit of a introduction um welcome everybody thank you very much for choosing to uh, to come along and listen to the, the session today um i'm uh, coming to you from the uh, from the uk where i run a business as uh, liz mentioned called 1948 and we're supplying um fully traceable and responsibly sourced colored gemstones um again as Liz said we mainly source from uh, sri lanka and tanzania and we've been doing that now for just under 10 years so i'm I would guess, uh, compared to some of the people in the industry, I'm quite a newbie, um, but uh, we've come quite a long way in a relatively short space of time. And I think the the main things really to say about our company is that we try to um, give as much you know, traceability and transparency to our gemstones as we absolutely can. And to do that, we try to source uh, as close to the, um, to the mines as possible. So we actually run our own mine through uh, my partner company, Crown Gems, in Sri Lanka. Um, we have our own cutting workshop also in Sri Lanka. Um, so we can take the, the rough material from our mine to our cutting workshop and then um, directly to the market. So it's the, the shortest possible supply chain and, and as traceable as we can make it. And that's really what we spent most of the last decade trying to set up um, so that we are able to have this uh, full traceability. And um, with our more recent projects, so the Ruby Fair project and the Moyo Gems project, again, we're working directly with miners um, and um, getting the rough material from the source um, so that we know exactly where it's come from. And that means that we can tell um, all of our customers all about the gemstones, even down to, um, especially in the case of Moyo, um, the individual miners who have uh, mined the gemstones. So it's a really a great level of detail. That's incredible um, to just be able to track that, to see the full supply chain and understand where everything's fully coming from and the transparency of it. It's really powerful. Um, so why the name 1948? <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, so when uh, when we started the business, I started with a good friend of mine who is uh, of Sri Lankan origin. His parents were both Sri Lankan. And he was the one who, who came to me with this amazing idea and he said, oh, fantastic idea. I've been to Sri Lanka you know, so many times and I know that there are amazing gemstones there and we should start a gem business. <laughs> um, and neither of us really knew much about it. But uh, of course, because of that connection, our, our main source at the beginning was Sri Lanka. So we thought, OK, well, we need a, a, a name that might have some significance um, and some connection with Sri Lanka. So 1948 is actually the, the year of independence um, of Sri Lanka. And we thought, well, that's, you know, that's quite a clever idea, because when we go to Sri Lanka, people will say, oh, you've chosen 1948, our, our year of independence. Um, and uh, actually what has happened is that, of course, most of the people we deal with in the gem industry there are um, certainly much younger than I am. And so they often ask us whether that was the year in which you know our company was founded or something like that. And every so often, even whether that's the year when I was born. So <laughs> which, <laughs> only after a particularly heavy weekend. <laughs> My guess was it was the year your company was founded, but I love that backstory. 
So what makes you different um, from other gem suppliers? Well, I think uh, the you know, things that I've mentioned already are really the, the main differentiators. When we, when we started off um, those years ago and we came into the industry, of course, we very naively thought that uh, yeah, we would be able to go and we would source gemstones and, and gem brokers and other gem traders would be able to tell us where their stones are from. Um, and as, of course, many of us know, that is, is really quite a rarity in our industry, even now, um, which is, uh, you know, it's, it's a great shame. And so, um, yeah, we, we thought, well, that's, that's going to be obvious. And then we realized very suddenly, you know, very soon, that that wasn't going to be um, the case and that we would have to really, uh, as, as I've mentioned, uh, control our own supply chain and set up our own supply chain so that we could give people some level of assurance um, that uh, that they were um, buying a gemstone from a particular place and that they could um, you know, have peace of mind that the gemstone was conflict free, was um, sourced in a responsible way, that there was no child labor involved, all of those kind of guarantees. Um, and of course, you know, as, as you're aware of, with the, uh, the Gem Boutique um, this year, we have a number of, of vendors now um, who are all doing very similar things in that respect. And it's fantastic that we've had this progress and we've been able to, um, to come together as a, a little family of, uh, of gem uh, suppliers with this same mentality and this same ethos um, that we're all you know, very keen to be able to um, tell people as much as we possibly can about their gemstones. Um, so whilst these are differentiators between my company and, and the, the wider world of gem traders, um, actually, you know, there are at least a few of us now that are doing these kind of things. That's really great. Um, my experience is more so in diamonds, which I know are very challenging mm -hmm. to trace. And also I work um, more so consumer facing as a marketer. Mm -hmm. And I know that this is top of mind for a lot of consumers. So I think it's uh, it's really interesting for me to learn more about it. And compared to 10 years ago, there's so many more suppliers and mm -hmm. there's more transparency in all of this. Um, so it's cool to see how everything's evolved. So in terms of um, ethical gemstones, how would you describe that? What that is? <laughs> That's a great question, which I, I'm asked <laughs> very frequently, in fact. And um, I think it I think it distills really into two components for most people. Uh, of course, the word ethics and ethical, they mean different things to different people. But when we're talking about the, the gemstones in the conversations that I have with our customers and with our um, you know, colleagues is that an ethical gemstone really is about uh, the people and the planet and how we treat both. So most of our customers are very concerned that, of course, everyone in the supply chain is treated fairly, um, that they're working in good conditions, that they are are being given a fair reward so that they are able to earn a decent living from their activities. So it's about um, taking care of the, the people at every stage of the, of the supply chain. And then this other aspect is really um, about the environmental side, of course, because you know, as you know, certainly dealing with diamonds, that um, you know, the horror stories and the video clips that you see all over the, the internet um, about the, you know, the huge impact of mining and how irresponsible mining has, has caused such destruction. So people are very concerned, naturally, as we, we all should be, um, about the impact of our mining operations in particular, um, but also the, you know, the, the processing and the cutting as well. Um, on uh, on the planet so making sure that of course we're not um, disturbing habitats that we're uh, land you know, restoring the land so land restoration is a is a huge topic um, and just making sure that we are taking care to absolutely you know, minimize our impact and use the best possible techniques so that whilst you know there's always going to be a bit of disruption from mining by the, the nature of the activity uh, but that we can do it in the most you know, responsible and uh, efficient way as possible, um, minimizing our impact. So I think really an ethical gemstone takes into account both of those elements or as much as possible of both elements, people and planet. That's an amazing answer. I think that um, it's become so important to end consumers um, because jewelry has become, it's always been this, but such a meaningful thing that you wear so close to your skin. So of course, um, 
it's important. Sorry, my light keeps changing. Um, it's so important that, that we know that this gem comes from a really special place, a really important, thoughtful, sustainable, ethical place. Mm -hmm. So uh, to you, what would you say sustainability means? Yes, that's interesting, of course, because uh, uh, we do hear a lot about the term of um, you know, sustainable mining um, when it's fairly apparent that you know, mining, in essence, is a is not a sustainable activity. You know, when you're digging things out of the ground that have taken millions of years to form and to get to a place where you can actually extract them, um, those those things aren't going to grow back in any time scale. Um, that is conceivable to you know to humans, and um, so it's a it's a bit of a kind of one way street when you're taking something out of the ground. Um, so for us, sustainability I think is all about making good use of the the resources of the money essentially that you are making from your gem mining activities, and especially with the um, you know, the Moyo Gems project um, that we, we mentioned earlier, and I hope people may be listening to the, the talk earlier on, you know, some kind of on-brand there with the Moyo um, prototype. But uh, yeah, with the Moyo project, it, there's a great emphasis really on uh, trying to use the money, obviously, initially to benefit the, the communities, um, you know, the mining communities directly, but also then to... Uh, allow them to have, say, money to invest in other activities so that they can have a more diverse um, economy than just relying on, on the mining itself, which eventually at some point will um, you know, probably diminish. So I think the you know, sustainability when it comes to mining is really looking at a bigger picture. So looking at um, you know, investment in other activities, looking at things like um, food security, you know, that type of thing is really important that um, you know that the communities are able to take some of that money and uh, invest it in these other things which will support um, support them in the in the longer term yeah um, I watched that chat earlier um, about Moyo gems and it's really interesting having heard about that project so uh, if you're able to go watch the replay definitely do that um, so let's talk more specifically about gems um, do you have any current favorites <laughs> um, well, that's sounding like a broken record. <laughs> um, I would say that the you know the gems that we're finding through the through the Moyo Gemstone Project um, are are my favourite in respect of the fact that they are having um, the biggest impact. Probably, you know, the, the, that project is is probably of the things that we've done so far with the business. Um, it's it's the most exciting project because of the impact and. The potential impact going forward um, that we're likely to have if uh, you know everything goes well and so i would say not just because they're beautiful gemstones i can show you a couple um, and you know some of them are on the uh, in the boutique or also that people can have a look at and um, yeah you know, they are in themselves and uh, you know, beautiful items but i think they're also amazing because of the fact that they are enabling this development and so that's what makes them much more of a favorite to me beyond just saying, oh, okay, I like blue sapphires, for example, <laughs> um, which of course I do because that is the, the amazing stone that we get from Sri Lanka. And I don't want this to be um, too biased towards the, the Moyo side. But uh, but yeah, I think the using you know, the the activities and uh, of the project and the um, using our industry, I guess, as a whole for something positive and something good um, is is what we're all about and everyone who probably is coming to this conference that's that's what they're interested in is how are they going to do things better how are we going to have a positive impact and probably for that reason beyond just the the beauty and the color um then the uh, you know the moyo stones are my my current favorite yeah, uh, Monica chimed in in the comments here saying, I love that Stuart's gems are cut in Sri Lanka um, by their team there. Cutting is a big question mark in the supply chain. Um, that's, that's very true. The, we do see a lot of um, about the, the mining side, as I was talking about just a second ago. Um, but we mustn't forget, of course, that the other crucial part of the supply chain is the cutting and the you know, the cutting and the faceting of the gemstones can be done sometimes in, in terrible conditions. So going back to what we were saying about the, um, you know, what is an ethical gemstone? The, the people aspect of that 
we mustn't forget that in the in the cutting environment, we equally have to look at the safety of the um, the gem cutters uh, as well as uh, the gem miners, um, because you know there are terrible um, diseases, breathing diseases, psychosis, and that kind of thing that um, you know that our cutters can suffer from if we don't take the right precautions. So, um, so absolutely, I mean, it's a, it's a crucial part of the uh, of the supply chain. And um, Melanie is so glad to have you here. She knows you've been working on these areas for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I have, and and you know, and, and the thing is, as I said, you know, we're we're part of a you know really nice family now of people, and some of whom have been working on it a lot a lot longer. Um, and I have you know, for whom I have great great respect. Um, and you'll hear from them um, later on in some of the later sessions. So thinking people like Eric Brownwatt and uh, Brian Cook in particular. Um, some amazing projects that they've been doing for decades so um so i'm not here to take it the the majority of the credit i think it's um you know i'm building on the efforts of, of some that have gone before <laughs> that's amazing um tanya says thank you for touching on cutting um and catherine uh is asking a question if you don't mind answering mm -hmm. um if you're able to speak to treat it heat it versus untreated stones and what kind of effect that has on the environment that might be off topic here but um, it might be, but I'm, I'm happy to give a, a quick answer to that. Um, so it depends on the treatments, of course, because there are so many things that you can do to different gemstones. Um, but if we take, for example, um, something like a heat treatment, because that's something that I'm, I'm quite familiar with. So um, with, with sapphires uh, in Sri Lanka, for example, um, it's very common to give them a, a fairly standard heat treatment. Um, so you're just using a, maybe an electric or a gas furnace it's a very um, small piece of um, equipment and it's a very controlled environment and so and it's a it's a fairly well recognized practice within the industry and what you're trying to do is to improve the color um, and the clarity of a gemstone and make it a, a, a better looking gemstone essentially and um, and in terms of the environmental impact well it depends how far you want to go in terms of your i guess analysis of um, the environmental because of course um, in the in the heating process then we will use um, different types of gas and that has to be created somewhere um, so there will be a, a I guess a carbon footprint or an environmental impact potentially with um, the gas production um, but I would say that it's relatively minimal um, we're, we're using very small amounts of the um, you know the gas or the electricity um, to actually um affect the heat treatment um, and I, I wouldn't like to go on to things like um irradiation of course that's a, you know, for summer stones that's a, a common treatment um and that's not something that we would um really get, get involved in to any great extent so um I, I would, got it. i'm not an expert on that area <laughs> got it thanks for answering that um no worries catherine for the off topic <laughs> We don't mind. We're here. Yeah, we're sure. glad. So let's look at some gems. What do you okay. have with you now? And we're going to look at the bigger gems because they show up better on camera. But you are able to go look at everything 1948 has to offer. I think that Rachel will probably drop a link into the um, chat with the gem shop. Okay. So I'm going to show, um, first of all, just a, a few gems. Like you say, I'm going to focus on some of the larger stones. Um, and these ones are actually in the, in the boutique as well. Um, and hopefully these will come out if I hold them up to the camera. So I'm going to break all of the, the rules of uh, handling gemstones and use my fingers so that I don't um, throw them across the room. Uh, so if I can just hold this up and see if uh, people can see oh, that. Wow. So I, it's it's hard to get a real appreciation. So this is uh, one of the garnets from the Moyo, uh, Moyo gems. Unfortunately, it's reflecting off my screen. Um, but it's a, a really beautiful deep red. As you can see, it's, it's a fairly large stone. Um, so that's uh, almost probably, um, it's about 15 to 17 millimeters, I think long. And uh, we find a lot of these really beautiful um, pyro rhodolite garnets um, in, the, in the region where we're operating in, um, in Tanzania with the, with the Moyo project. This one has a, a deeper red color, so I'm hoping it might come out a little bit better. Um, I'll put it closer to the camera. Oh yeah. 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 Um, you can tell, yeah. You can see the color. At least I feel like I can see the color there. Really yeah. beautiful. <laughs> uh, not quite the clarity of the, the first stone, but certainly a really, really deep red. 
Um, so we get some really beautiful uh, colours ranging from this red through to um, more of a, a purple, purplish red, um, and then through even to um, a kind of pinky purple colour colour range. Um, and then lastly, let's try this one. This is one of the, the smaller of the ones that I was going to show, um, which is a Marcus. I don't know if you can quite catch the purple coming through there. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, so you can see it's just a slightly different shade compared to those uh, those other two. And then, um, I mean, we find a lot of uh, quartz varieties and things. So actually, I could just show you. I mean, here's a here's a rough piece. This is is not in the boutique, but just um, as a, by way of a kind of view of the size. You know, this is a piece of citrine um, that we found quite a, a clean piece um, that I have available. So I chose not to cut that one. Sometimes we get asked for, for pieces that people want to cut themselves. So it's always good to have a couple of those in stock. Um, and so from those large pieces of quartz, either citrine or also amethyst, um, then we're able to cut some pretty cool stones. And one of the advantages of having our own cutting workshop is of course that um, I can speak really you know, very directly and closely with our cutters and give them a little bit more of a, a free range. So you can see with this amethyst, it's a very unusual cut. Um, not for everyone, but uh, we have a lot of customers who really like the um, the less uh, standard cuts. So with things like amethyst and citrine that we find in large pieces and, and um, fairly regularly, um, then we're able to, to let our cutters sometimes just express themselves. So they don't always have to just cut, you know, seven millimeter round. <laughs> Yeah, I love the cut of that stone and that amethyst seems a little bit, I'm not an expert, amethyst is my first stone, I don't usually love it, but it feels yeah. like a lighter purple. It is, yes, actually I can show you. So by comparison, oops, if, uh, if I show you this one, so this is a Sri Lankan amethyst um, and hopefully you'll be able to see, it actually looks a little bit kind of almost like a tanzanite actually on the screen, but um, it's, that's a, it's a much deeper purple. Um, and. Uh, yeah, so that's uh, probably what people would call a more traditional amethyst color. Um, but we do find, you know, in um, in Tanzania that we also find the, uh, the lighter ones. Um, just to finish off a, a, a couple of the more unusual pieces, uh, rough pieces from the, the Moyo side before we move on, um, I wanted to show you, I noticed the, um, the gentleman who was speaking earlier about in the um, Malawi presentation, he had a piece of scapolite and I suddenly had scapolite envy because um, I only have one that is this size, uh, which is an amazing piece, great crystal structure. Um, but uh, but his was about three times as big, I think. <laughs> um, but again, you can see that you, know, you could cut quite a large um, gemstone or maybe a, a few different stones from a piece um, as big as that. And then if we're really lucky, and these are the pieces that I can't resist, even though they're they're not really what we focus on as a business, um, then you'll get one with a beautiful crystal shape like this. Um, so unfortunately, the, the color isn't quite coming across, but this is in fact corundum, this is ruby. Um, wow. And uh, you can see the, the really good um, hexagonal um, crystal shape that comes through. Um, so what I did do was with a smaller piece that was like that, um, was I had one of our cutters just indulge me and create this little egg. <laughs> Oh, I love that. Yeah, so I haven't actually put that on our website because I'm not sure I can part with that one. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so it's amazing the range of material that we're finding um, with Moyo. And I know that you'll be able to see some more in the in the Anza Gems presentation later. Um, that, uh, you know, that's it's uh, yeah, it's fascinating as a as a gem supplier, you know, just to be there dealing with the miners. Um, I wasn't going to show any of the, the smaller stones, as you said, because it's a little bit too tricky on the on the camera. Um, but then just moving on to some of our um, Sri Lankan stones, um, I showed already the, the amethyst. This one is uh, one of the cut citrine, um, really beautiful stone. Um, and uh, this one will have been heat treated as well, actually, um, to get this amazing color, but, uh, but still absolutely stunning. So you can see that there, I mean, really, a stone like this shows the um, the skill level that we're lucky enough to have in the um, uh, in the cutting um, community in Sri Lanka. I mean, they've been cutting gemstones there for such a long time that uh, we are um, very fortunate to have some from very skilled people indeed. That was um, incredible. That citrine. Yes, and it's uh, and then just just to go one step bigger. 
Um, this one actually came from our own uh, gem mine in Sri Lanka. So this is an aqua. Uh, this is wow. a 60 carat aqua. This one is in the boutique. Um, if anyone's looking to make a, a huge pendant or <laughs> maybe a tiara or something like that, um, then uh, you can have a look at this one. But uh, yeah, this one came off a, a really large block of aquamarine that we found and it was the, uh, the, the cleanest, biggest stone that we could cut from that block. So really quite a spectacular stone. Ideal for this kind of presentation being so massive. <laughs> People are shocked in the comments about that aquamarine and it would be perfect for a tiara. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, I'm going to just mention one of the um, country that we sourced from, that we, we sourced from a, um, a particular project in um, Malawi. So just following on again from the, the previous presentation, because these are currently um, a couple of the biggest sapphires that I have in my collection, so I wanted to show these. Um, I'm hoping that the colour will uh, will come out okay. But this one is uh, just over an eight carat sapphire. Um, I don't know if you can see the, and and this is has the very distinctive um, kind of greenish blue. So it's not quite focus, greenish blue colour, um, as opposed to the royal blue. Um, so a beautiful again cushion cut, um, very large sapphire. Um, but if you really want to impress your friends, um, then probably this is this is the sapphire that you need, which is um, just a shade over 11 carats. Um, and again, a, a, it's a it's a nicer, darker blue actually, not so much of the the green um, tinge to it. Um, and uh, yes, that would uh, sit nicely on someone's finger, I'm sure. I love um, the shape of that one. Also, also in the uh, the gem boutique. And Rachel is sharing the links to these stones. Thank oh, you. Oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, do you have more? Uh, I think those are the main main ones that I was going to show because those are the the large ones that people can appreciate through the through the camera. Yep, definitely. And um, all the links are in the chat, so make sure you visit um, 1948's uh, Gem Boutique. Uh, and look at all of the stones available. So I was wondering, um, because I work more client facing directly with designers, um, mm -hmm. as a marketer, I was wondering what trends you're seeing uh, in terms of gemstones. Um, the trends, I think, I think this is a, a benefit of, of being quite, a, like I said before, a newbie to the industry um, is that I don't have a, a lot of the, um, the historical perspective. And I think what I've seen probably in the the trends in the last 10 years is that you know, the very recent trends is that um, and I think this is probably generally accepted in the industry is that there's been quite a shift uh, away from diamonds to colored stones in general yeah exactly. so I mean, working in diamonds you may have, have come across that mm -hmm. yourself um, so I think that you know obviously that's great for me because <laughs> that's what I'm, I'm uh, trading in um, and I think also on top of that that there has probably been uh, more, people have been more adventurous. You know, people have looked outside of the big three. And although I love to, you know, I'd love you know, to sell a sapphire, that's great, you know, beautiful stones. But when someone comes to me, you know, for example, from the Moyo um, project, again, we had some kyanite. And I don't know if people are familiar, but it's a beautiful kind of blue, green, almost like a, an aquamarine on a good day. Um, and, it, it you know it it was just something unusual but and of course for a designer that can be quite a challenge because you make up a beautiful piece with some kyanite and most of your customers will come along and go, what's a kyanite I don't know you know um, but I've noticed as a trend that people have been ready to look at less common uh, types of gemstone and put those into their pieces which is fantastic because that's what we want we want all of those stones that people are working so hard to get out of the ground. Um, we want them to be worn, you know, that's, that's mm -hmm. the whole thing. Um, and then I think the, the last thing in terms of the trends, of course, is um, it, what we're all talking about throughout this whole week um, is the, you know, the responsible sourcing, um, you know, the sustainability, if you like, as well, um, and the traceability and the transparency. So that really, even when I came into the industry, it was uh, not even really on the you know the bottom of people's agendas at conferences and now we have our own conferences and and every event you go to and every piece of marketing almost you see now from the big organizations from the big um, jewelry brands they are taking into account um, you know their commitments to you know, responsible sourcing so that is definitely a trend and and that's only going to go one way and I think it, you know, the 
the conditions that we found this year with the pandemic, of course, I think have focused people even more on um, how they um, consume and the the choices they are making when they're buying things. So, um, yeah, I think we're going to see even more of that and, and that's how it should be. So those are the major trends. I completely agree. Um, and that's what I'm seeing from my end too. Lots of colored gemstones, mm -hmm. um, very much a focus on sustainability um, and the ethical side of things. And then also just um, the meaning. I feel like people connect with gemstones and consumers, people who don't know anything about gems will connect with that kyanite because it's the color that they love and it's just, mm -hmm. it's, it's striking to them. Yeah. Um, and they're not worried about it being a sapphire or a ruby or an emerald. Mm -hmm. So. Yes, I think so. I think it's great to see people being more adventurous um, and uh, yeah, just really embracing the, you know, the story of the gems and the background of the gemstone um, and really wanting to, um, to buy things that have a much more meaning, um, you know, as much more significance, not just to themselves, but also to the, to the people that have been involved in, in the production of those pieces. So, um, so that's great to see. Um, yeah, very good. Well, thank you so much, Stuart. Um, again, make sure you visit 1948's gem shop today. Um, now that you know the whole background um, and Stuart's favorite gems and what he has to offer, definitely check that out. Um, thank you so much for being here. No, thank you very much, Liz. It's been great. And I've just put a few links into the uh, into the chat for oh, people great. to follow us on social media. So, very good. Thank you, everyone, for uh, for coming along and listening. Yep. Thank you. Stay tuned for more.